So in this video, we are going to be talking about navigation tips when working in Studio One. Now, what I've done here basically is I've just made a list of some things that I use on a regular basis when working with Studio One, and I just kind of wanted to go over them. And uh, maybe this is something that might be useful to different people out there who are watching this video. So this is in no particular order of importance. These are just the different things that came off the top of my head. I haven't rehearsed this or anything. We're just gonna kind of roll through this as we go. So first off, we'll talk about locate mouse cursor. And also I'm gonna talk about um, double clicking or I think might even be single clicking in empty space of a track. So when I first came over to Studio One was in version two, right before version three came out. And at that point, we didn't have the smart tool, which we can activate over here. Now we did have an arrow tool and a range tool separately, but 99% of the time I had things set to the arrow tool. And I'm pretty sure that my secondary tool was set to the split tool when I very first started working in Studio One. So basically um, what this meant is that if I wanted to position something at a very, very specific place, I would have to click in the top area of the timeline here. Now for me, it can be a little bit more useful just to kind of hover my cursor and say like, that's where I want my cursor. So for that case, we have the locate mouse cursor shortcut. And if you're looking for this, it's pretty easy to map out. It's the last shortcut that I use. So you'll find it locate mouse cursor. I've mapped that out to command spacebar. I'm pretty sure I may have had to remap something in my operating system so that they didn't conflict. And the reason that I use that quite simply is because a lot of the times when I was using this, I wanted to locate my mouse cursor and play. So it was like, it was like command spacebar, spacebar. Just a very quick action which would allow me to locate my mouse cursor and immediately start playing. Now, even though we have this smart tool, and even though the range tool essentially can do the exact same thing by just single clicking, it became such a muscle memory thing for me that I actually left this in place and I still use it all the time. Even though we have the new smart tool, which basically gives me the ability to do that, I can still use this crosshair cursor over here and say, right, I wanna locate my mouse cursor to there and then do whatever I need to do. All right, next up we have markers and arranger track. Okay, so if we take a look over here, we have our full song. Now at this point, basically they're almost all the same except for just for the sake of adding them. I've added an additional couple markers over here just so that it's different from the arranger sections. Now, sometimes I'll start with arranger blocks and I'll right click and create markers from arranger sections. Sometimes I'll start from my markers and I'll right click and I'll create a ranger sections for my markers. But regardless of how I start or how I work, we have the ability to use a previous and next command to go to our different markers at any given point in time. We can kind of like cycle through our markers and that can be a really quick way to navigate. Now, in addition to that, let's say that your arranger tracks are different. So let's say for example, that this arranger track over here was butting up against this area. And then we have all these markers in between. Sometimes I will do this in a production or a mix session. I might create additional markers, which indicate that I want to be able to move to the previous marker and play maybe through a transition to make sure that I've got a transition level effect set properly in the mix. But in that case, we can go previous and next with markers, but we can also go previous and next with our ranger sections. So I've got a different shortcut which brings my arranger sections into view. So if I wanted to skip everything and go right from verse to the chorus, I've skipped all those markers. And if I needed to back up, I could use the previous and next markers command. Now, these are mapped out, or at least the uh, previous and next markers, they are mapped out again by default. Go to next marker and go to previous. I'm pretty sure that this is a default mapping, but I'm not 100% sure. In terms of the other mapping, uh, previous and next arranger sections, I'm quite certain that I actually had to map that out manually. And I think I just used kind of like a variation and I used the N and the B because I already have the memory of using that command. So one thing to point out with the marker section though, or uh, rather the arranger section, is that if you have a specific track that's in focus and you use that command, notice that it does steal focus. And also you can do the previous and next markers or arrange sections from a control surface such as a fader port. So that's another reason why I really like that. Okay, next up we have by bars. This is something, again, I'm fairly certain this is something that's mapped out in the default Studio One mapping, but it is shift and it is the plus or minus key on a numeric keypad. This will allow you to move in bars. 
So we talk about these scenarios, for example, over here, where we're talking about where we are at the first, that I can go to the next arranger section or the previous arranger section. I can also go to the next bar or the previous bar. But in between those zoom sections where I'm using those commands, I can also use my previous and next um, bar commands, which is a shortcut that's mapped out, or you can map it out if you want to work that way. All right, next up, let's take a look at, okay, creating a macro that stacks uh, that command. So this command I think is pretty useful, right? Being able to go to the previous and next bar, that can be useful. But let's say you don't yet have an arranger section mapped out for here, but you've done some work in your timeline. Now, I don't necessarily want to have to mouse click and do this if I'm already, if my hands are near my keyboard shortcuts or I'm just used to using keyboard shortcuts. This is a little inefficient to have to press this so many times if I wanted to move from, let's say, bar 57 to bar 65. I don't want to have to do that. So what I've done is you can basically just create a macro that stacks that command on top of each other multiple times. So if we take a look at that situation, I've created a macro, one, two. This macro basically just stacks that command on top of each other four times. So if you're looking to create macros, they're very easy to do. We can go to our macro organizer. I don't remember what I called this. I guess what I could do is let's fire this off and go to our uh, keyboard shortcuts and this should tell me um, rewind bar. Okay, it's not telling me where the macro was used. Uh, another way to find it quickly is to enter something that you've used and then it'll tell you, okay, macros forward four bars. So that's what I ended up calling it in the macro organizer. So let's try to see if we can do this. Should be in alphabetical order, L M N O P. Oh, but it's got categories too. Okay. No worries. We'll create that from scratch. So I'm going to say forward, I can say forward, navigation forward, or transport forward, forward bar. So basically, I would just add this four times, and then I could give it a title, put it in a group, give it a description, and then once I add this and link it to a key command, or technically you could link it to a button in your macro bar, then it's very easy to just stack that up. And you could stack, you could have it say you want one for four bars, maybe we want it for eight, or we want it for 16. For me, to be completely honest, if I click this twice, that's eight bars. If I click it twice again, that's 16 bars. That's a pretty good course movement in terms of moving my cursor at an exact bar boundary. So I don't really worry about it too much. Okay. Next up, we have events, left and right, locate, selection, selection end. And also this is a very important preference to talk about cursor follows edit position. So let's talk about that. First of all, cursor follows edit position. I think there's two trains of thought on this. I know some people who love this preference and they leave it on all the time. And I know other people who just find it annoying. So what does that mean? It means that if I either make a highlighted selection with my arrow tool, that it's going to snap to the beginning of that selection. And also if I click on something directly, it will be snapping to the exact position of the event in terms of the very start position. That might be something that you like. I like it 98% of the time. We'll talk about what, when I don't use it, but for the, most, for the most part, if I click something, that's what I'm used to. I'm used to my cursor snapping there. If you don't wanna have that on though, you can basically make selections and then it's not necessarily moving your transport to the very beginning of that because you've selected it. We do have an option though to click the L key, which is locate selection. So if you're not using cursor follows edit position for whatever reason, then if you make a selection, it's just a matter of clicking the L key. And if you're using one hand on a keyboard and one hand on a mouse, I don't think it's that difficult. But that can be really, really useful. Now I'm going to open that up again because I want to see, okay, left, right, locate selection, locate selection, and cursor follows edit position. Okay. So if we talk about left, right, um, again, in terms of navigating, this is moving through the different events and I can just move through these very quickly and I can visually see what's highlighted and of course, locate selection to locate the cursor to that position. I'm going to re-enable this preference because I actually prefer it. Now, when we talk about having an event selected, for example, let's talk about this one over here. By default, 
If you make a selection, you select that event with cursor follows edit position enabled, it's automatically going to locate to the beginning of the event. And I think that's kind of what we would expect. But we also have the ability to use another shortcut, which is locate selection end. So these are other ways to navigate. And this kind of works in lots of different areas. So for example, I have the arranger track selected, locate selection, but I can locate the selection end. So it works not only just for actual events like audio events and instrument parts or um, audio parts and things like that, but if you wanted to move over three or four different ones and then I wanted to go to the end, that's something that we can do. Now, these options over here, locate selection, I'm, I'm pretty sure, maybe 90% sure that locate selection is mapped out by default and locate selection end is something that I had to map out. Now I use the key right beside it because it's really easy for me to be able to do that. Just make a selection and then I can choose between locate the selection beginning or locate the selection end. Okay, now let us talk about home and end keys based on track selection. So let's kind of get a zoom overview on this track over here. If I select one of these tracks, for example, let's select this track. I'm going to do a bit of a data zoom or rather a, a horizontal zoom, a vertical zoom so we can see a little bit better. There's a really quick and easy way to be able to move to the very beginning of your track and select the first event and then to be able to move to the very end and select the last event. And that's by using the home and end key. So again, home is going to bring me to the very beginning of the very first track that we have. And the end key is going to bring me to the very beginning of the last event. So we have so many different events here. And depending on where your zoom size is sitting, I could be sitting at this and it'd be really hard for me to single click on this exact event perfectly. I can just do this. And then of course, when you combine that with something like shift S, I've just gone to a, 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 an, an absolute you know, zoom in of that one particular element. And then I could shift S again, click end, and then I could shift S on this to bring that into focus. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to call that part one. And then in the next video, we'll just continue exactly where we left off and we'll pick up because I don't want to make these too long. And I want to make sure that the information can soak in and that I'm not throwing too much information all at once. So anyways, that's it for this video. I will catch you for part two of this next week. We'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.